welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to look at the multiple choice section from the 2022 paper for advanced hire. This paper and the other past papers are all linked down below in the description box. Question 1 is looking at atomic emission spectroscopy. This happens when you excite an electron from a ground state to a higher energy level. You do this excitation by using heat in such as a flame test. The electron will then fall back to ground state, releasing the photon of energy, which will be equivalent to the energy difference between the two levels. The question is looking for the incorrect statement. Each element will have a characteristic spectrum due to its different energy levels. Visible light is not used to promote the electron's heat is. Each of the lines corresponds to an electron transition, and the quantity of the element can be detected using the intensity of the light. Therefore, B is the answer to this question. For question 2, you'll need to use your data book to find the electron arrangement of a chromium atom. From there, you can then work out the electron arrangement of a chromium ion. The electron arrangement in the data book for a chromium atom is 2, 8, 13, 1. This will give an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1 and 3d5. If you turn this into a chromium 1 plus ion, then you remove one electron. The electron that is removed is removed from the 4s shell. This means that the electron configuration will have 3d5 as its highest energy subshell. Therefore, there will be five electrons, d. Question three is looking at transition metal complexes. An octahedral complex will have a coordination number of six for the metal. Here we have a metal with a two plus charge. We have a coordination number of six, so we'll put that into the diagram. Each of the ligands is bidentate. This means that it will join through two atoms. Therefore, we will only need three ligands for this complex. Each of the ligands has a charge of minus one. This means that the ligands are giving an overall charge of minus three. With the metal as a charge of plus two, this means that the complex overall will have a charge of minus one. Therefore, the answer will be D as we have M with three L ligands and a charge of minus one overall. Question four is about catalysis. Heterogeneous catalysts are found in a different state to their reactants. Due to having unpaired D electrons, reactant molecules are able to adsorb to the surface of the catalyst. This then allows a lower energy pathway. Statement A describes a homogeneous catalyst. Question 5 is looking at redox reactions in which a single element is both oxidised and reduced. To do this, we need to calculate the oxidation numbers for the elements within the reactions. For the first reaction, chlorine is reduced and iodine is oxidised. For the second reaction, although we're only looking at iodine, which is both reduced and oxidised, it is coming from two different species in the reactants and is therefore not the correct answer. For the third equation, we have two elements again which are being reduced and oxidised, therefore it is not the correct answer. In the final equation, we have elemental chlorine with an oxidation number of zero. This is reacting to be reduced to chlorine with an oxidation number of minus one and oxidized to chlorine with an oxidation number of plus one. Question six is looking at neutral solutions at 325 Kelvin. The concentration of hydrogen ions and therefore pH and Kw all depend on temperature. However, neutral solutions will always contain an equal concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Therefore, this does not depend on temperature, and C will be the correct answer. Question 7 is looking at equilibrium and what happens when pressure is changed. Equilibrium constant is only changed by changing temperature. Therefore, changing the pressure will have no effect on the con equilibrium constant. According to Le Chatelier's principle, if you increase the pressure of an equilibrium, it will move to reduce the pressure. In this case, this means it will move to the side where there is SO3. This means there will be an increase in the concentration of SO3 at equilibrium. The standard enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change associated with the formation of one mole of a substance from its elements in standard states. For A, none of the substances within the equation are in their standard states. For B, the elements are not present in their standard states. For C, chlorine is not present in its standard state of Cl2. Therefore, D is the answer. For question 9, we've been given a rate equation. We can see that A is squared. This means that A is second order. This means that when you double the concentration of A, you will quadruple the rate. B is to the power of 1. This means that it's first order. 
When you double the concentration of B, you will double the rate. Looking at the answers, doubling the concentration of A will not double the rate. Doubling the concentration of B will double the reaction rate. Question 10 is testing your knowledge of kinetics. The order of a reaction can only ever be obtained by experiment. Question 11 is looking at changes in entropy when we melt and boil a substance. Whenever you melt or boil a substance, the temperature will stay constant during that process. This means you will see a vertical line on the graph. The entropy change associated with boiling is greater than with melting because there will be a larger increase in disorder. Therefore, the vertical line will be larger for boiling. Question 12 is looking at hybridization within ethane. Ethane has the formula C2H2. It has a carbon to carbon triple bond and it has sp hybridization within this. There will be two sp hybridized orbitals and two unhybridized p orbitals. This means that C will be the appropriate hybridization diagram. Question 13 is looking for molecules which only contain sigma bonds. This will be molecules which contain only single bonds. If we draw out each of the molecules, we can see which of these will be correct. For C2H4, we have a carbon to carbon double bond. This will contain a sigma and a pi bond. Within H2O, we have two single bonds. Within O2, we have an oxygen to oxygen double bond and nitrogen has an end to end triple bond. Both of these will contain pi bonds. In 14, we're looking at the mechanism for the addition of HBr to a carbon to carbon double bond. This is an electrophilic addition process. The high electron density within the carbon to carbon double bond will be attracted to the partially positive hydrogen in the HBr bond. Therefore, we can eliminate B and D as options. The intermediate for this process is a carbocation intermediate. That seen in C is what would happen when you add a halogen onto a carbon to carbon double bond. Question 5 is looking for a compound which contains a phenyl group. A phenyl group has the formula C6H5. This is a benzene ring where one of the hydrogens has been substituted for something else. Looking at these structures, only D contains a phenyl group. For question 16, you're best to try and draw out what is happening in this reaction. We have 2 chlorobutane and it's reacting with the Cn minus ion. This is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So we will substitute the Cl for the Cn. When you then react with the hydrogen ions and water, this is acid hydrolysis. This will acid hydrolyze the CN into a carboxyl group. This means that you'll end up with 2 methyl butanoic acid. For question 17, you're naming an ether. Ethers are named by finding the longest chain hydrocarbon and naming this. You then add the alkoxy part onto the star as if it's a branch. Here we have ethoxy. We need to name the longer chain hydrocarbon part as if the Ethoxy part is joined on at the start of the molecule, therefore this will be 3-methylbutane. The ethoxy is joined on to carbon number 1, making B the answer. For question 18, we're looking at ketoenol tautomerism. For this to take place, you need to have a hydrogen atom attached to the carbon adjacent to the C double bond O group. In A, there is a CH3 group adjacent to the carbonyl. In C, there is a CH group. In B, there is a CH2 but in D, there is no CH bond. In question 19, we're looking for non-superimposable mirror images. This means that we are looking for optical isomers, compounds which contain a chiral carbon. Compounds which contain a chiral carbon have a carbon which has four different groups attached. Sometimes these can be difficult to spot. The carbon in the centre of A has two H groups. The carbon in the centre of B has four different groups, NH2, CH3, H and C double bond O, OH. Compound C has two CH3 groups attached to one carbon, and compound D has two C2H5 groups attached. In question 20, we've been given data from elemental microanalysis. This means that we can calculate the empirical formula for compound X. We take the masses given, 0.12 grams of carbon and 0.02 grams of hydrogen. If we divide them by the gram formula mass for each of these elements, then we will get the number of moles of carbon and hydrogen present. We then divide by the smallest number of moles. This allows you to calculate the smallest whole number ratio of the two elements present, which will be CnH2n. We can then look at each of the answers. For A, we have C4H4. For B, we have C4H6. For C, we have C4H8. And for D, we have C4H10. This means that C fits the formula that we've calculated. 
Question 21 is looking at mass spectrum. We have a molecular ion peak at 74. The molecular ion peak will be present at the GFM. This is where just one electron has been knocked off. There are fragment peaks at 15, 31 and 43. The first thing to do is to calculate the GFM of each of the compounds that we've been given. A has a GFM of 74, B has a GFM of 74, C has a GFM of 72, as does D. This means that only A or B can be our options. We can now draw out the structures for A and B so that we can find what fragments might be available. In A we have a CH3 group which would have a mass of 15. There is a C2H5 group which would have a mass of 27. A COOH group which would have a mass of 45. A CH2COOH group which would have a mass of 59. And an OH group with a mass of 17. These do not match the fragments in the question. In B, we have two CH3 groups which would have a mass of 15. There's a CH3CO group which would have a mass of 43, and there's a CH3O group which would have a mass of 31. These fragments match those which are given in the question, therefore B must be the compound. In question 22, you're given the structural formula of malic acid. This contains two carboxyl groups, therefore this will react with sodium carbonate in a 1 to 1 mole ratio. We need to calculate the number of moles of malic acid which are present by doing mass divided by gram formula mass. This gives a number of moles of 0.05 moles of malic acid and therefore 0.05 moles of sodium carbonate. Question 23 is a stoichiometric calculation. We have 2.52 grams of hydrated calcium chloride with the formula CaCl2-2H2O. From this, we can calculate the number of moles of hydrated calcium chloride. First we must calculate the gram formula mass of the hydrated calcium chloride. This comes out to be 147. Using this and the mass in the question, we can calculate the number of moles at 0.017. The number of moles of calcium chloride after heating to constant mass will be the same as the hydrated moles. We also need to calculate the gram formula mass of calcium chloride. This is 111. If we multiply this by the number of moles that we calculated previously, then we'll get a mass of 1.887, which will round to 1.9. Answer B. Question 24 is looking for a technique which can purify and identify a compound. For purification, we're looking for techniques which will separate. The techniques which will separate here are distillation, recrystallization and solvent extraction. Melting point determination will only identify, not separate. To identify a compound, you want to look at a characteristic. Recrystallization and solvent extraction will not look at any characteristics, whereas distillation will allow you to look at boiling point. Question 25 is looking at thin layer chromatography. We have a spot which is a spot of pure reactant. C is a co-spot of the reactant and the reaction mixture, whereas S is a spot of the reaction mixture on its own. The question is looking for the correct statement. For A, the reaction mixture does not contain impurities. Whilst there is only one spot in the reaction mixture, it is pure, however, it may be all impurities and not the compound we're looking for. For B, all of the reactant has been used up. Within the reactant mixture sample, there is no spot just for the pure reactant. For C, only the desired product is present. We don't know if this spot represents the, de the desired product. And D, the reaction is complete. This spot could represent an intermediate and therefore the reaction may not be complete. This means that B will be the answer. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem and Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for updates on new videos and flashcards throughout the year. Bye for now.